there are a lot of different optic um, mounts that are out on the market. Let's talk next what are pros and cons to some of them and what might be the best for you and your application. The next thing I'm gonna do is try to go back in time just a little bit. It won't be perfect, but nevertheless. So let's just say that this is a close Mark 18 clone. This just happens to be a Noveski. Obviously this um, T2 and this uh, ADM mount are not part of the original setup. Rear sight though, definitely. So let's talk about a couple things. <clears throat> the first general mount that I saw in the military was the Wilcox mount. And that was utilized with the Aimpoint Comp M1. And where that put the, the, the optics, so to speak, was between the irons and the glass. <clears throat> it sat in basically one half of the glass, okay? So to me, it was a, it was a half co-witness. And the theory behind that was if I'm looking through my irons, right, or my irons are right there and a the red dot happens to go out, I immediately can get back on a gun and continue shooting even though my dot went out. Now, <clears throat> I'm not a fan, and some people did it. Some people would look through rear sight, red dot, front sight, target. To me, you just added in another anomaly of something that I got to concentrate on. And the whole part of the red dot was for the speed plus low light, no light situations. It gave me something to visually be able to use an, as an aiming device. Now, when you start to look at um, what we used to do is this is how the rear sight is typically configured and set up. We used to flip it into this half position right here. And what that did visually is it just cleaned up the rear out of the way and it messed up a lot of people up in the beginning because they would see the uh, red dot jump above the front sight. Couple things, when guys would go overseas, a lot of times there wasn't a lot of equipment and whoever was overseas had the good stuff, right? So in this case, the red dot, the mount, all that stuff. We had irons. So what would happen is you would go over, your irons are already zeroed. You would do a crew change. You take that red dot, you throw it on top of your gun, and then you would co-witness it to your irons, which basically meant you got them pretty damn close. However, you still had to go shoot that independently. So that, um, that first kind of mounting series was derived around if your dot goes out, you're immediately on your irons. After that, it started to change. As optics uh, started getting more reliable out on a marketplace, I man, I, I, I don't know if I'm quoting this right, but I remember at least the first one that I remember being a lower one third uh, co-witness was the LaRue mount. Now this just happens to be a spur mount. The other mount that you saw a minute ago was a ADM mount. And that lower one third we really liked because mainly I wanted to focus on the optic and just my red dot. However, if I did need to quote unquote flip up my irons, my irons would be in the lower one third of that glass. So what you immediately found was a little bit easier to shoot, a little easier to find, and it wasn't as busy. Now in improvised shooting positions, when we're not vertical, we also knew that and, and found out that it was a little easier to, to find our dot and get on the gun. Um, so in some of the positions, getting that dot a little higher really added in to being a nice benefit. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna move even more um, in regards to more height above uh, what we're used to. This height we're gonna get into is a 193 mount. And it's always weird because I remember so like so long ago, everybody was really trying to jam their optic down as low as possible so they wouldn't have to worry about height over bore. So it would be very minimal. And nowadays it's kind of laughable to think that, that that's the way we thought and that's the way we acted. When in reality, you just need to know where to put the bullet. That's really it. It doesn't need to get any complicated, more complicated than, than what it is. And what you're starting to see is this increase in height. Now, not just for, for fighting, but also you got a lot of um, guys out there, neck injuries, bodies moving weird ways, um, shoulder, shoulder and a gun you immediately find in a vertical position or kneeling position, things like that, or 
improvised shooting positions, which we talked about a second ago. The 193 mount is now about as low as I want to go. I'll start kind of getting into some of the other mounts that I've been using a little bit more frequently. But the only solution generally right now out on a market that I'm aware of is off angle irons if you're running this particular mount because most people aren't doing specific irons for all these mount heights that are coming out on the market. So this just happens to be um, a mount by Reptilia. I'll show you another one. This just happens to be a 193 on a MP5. Now what this allows you to do is this allows me, based on where it's located when the stock's fully out, this allows me to start getting into shooting passive. Now don't get me wrong, if I had to, I could shoot passive on the lower mounts, but there's a difference between are you doing it and making it happen and making it work, or is it actually easy for you to do? And this height right here uh, on this particular gun works really well as a 193 um, with the uh, 509T from Hollow Sun. So makes it a lot easier for shooting passive. And we'll talk about what that is here in a second. I've got a few different mounts. This one's a 193 by Geisley. So you can check that out. The real difference is just this big bolt kind of hanging off the side. A lot of the companies now have kind of cleaned that up to where it's a little more streamlined, which I really like. The next one, and this is sometimes based on contracts, there are certain either agencies or military organizations that have to quote unquote check the box for we have backup iron sights on the gun and as i was explaining as we start to go higher into some of these arenas they don't make backup iron sights that um either do a lower one third or a half co-witness with some of these optics because they're going to take up a lot of space on the gun not only that but some of the guns that guys are using are sometimes like the sig rattlers and um maybe it's like an mp5 or or um or something similar in regards to how small it is some of the bnts that are out on the market the apc 9k so what um, Anvil has done is to get around that kind of contract issue, they install with the mount a sight system. Um, how good is it? Well, you're not going to be shooting national match with a, you know, two inch sight radius. However, it ends up meeting the criteria because technically by definition, um, this does meet a it has backup iron sights on it already, quote unquote, even built in. Now they do a really good job of keeping them nice in that lower quadrant and out of the way so it's more of a low witness. Uh, so just something to think about. Now, a mount that's been out on the market uh, for a while now is, and I, I believe my numbers are correct, I believe this is a um, Knight's Armor, I know it's a Knight's Armament, but a Knight's Armament uh, 233 mount, so 2.33 uh, height. In the beginning, I always remembered because they made a subtle change. This has the burner mount. And that meant Jerry Barnhart, um, in collaboration with Knight's Armament, kind of did an effort to where it was about this height, camp levered out, and that allowed the guys to run passive. Um, then later on, they kind of put this here because you could install like a flip up rear sight or do some other things to it. Now, these are very specialty mounts. When we start getting into this style of height, we're getting into a, a, into a, what I'm going to call a specialty height, which is gas masks, running SCBAs, pappers, when you get a lot of hoses on your face, running night vision, shooting passive. And shooting passive, for those that don't know what that is, that's where I get my night vision behind the red dot and I shoot the gun that way, meaning I don't want any IR signature because if somebody else happens to have night vision, they're going to know right where I am as soon as I cut that um, IR across the battlefield. So nevertheless, this allows us to shoot passive and it gets it up to a very manageable height. Next mount that I'm going to talk about is this mount from Unity Tactical. <clears throat> Basically, it sits at, I believe, a 2.26 height, okay? It does have backup irons in it. You're probably not going to be able to see them too well. I've got a front sight right here, and then in the rear is a normal little ghost ring. And again, that's for those guys on those military and law enforcement contracts that have to, quote unquote, have some form of a backup on it. Um, do they work well? You know what? I would I'd probably just shoot the guy through the glass because trying to get my head down there and see through that dark area. So I didn't buy this mount because of the iron sight capability. I bought it because it allows me to do a lot of things. And it's, to me, it's probably one of the most versatile 
uh, mounting solutions that are out on the market. And the reason being is because I can run magnified. So this happens to be a um, EOTech uh, 5 by magnifier that American Outlaw sent me so I could kind of get this done. And between this, the mount, and my setup, it's a really good kind of one size fits all. Here's what I mean about that. I can shoot this passively. And we talked about the benefits of being able to engage through your optic and leave as low of a signature as possible. I'm also able to reach out and touch targets. So sometimes guys go in in the military, they go hit a place and it's all good up until the point to where they start you know, shooting. And then targets start popping up at variable distances as they're trying to make their way out. To ha to have the ability to jump on magnification is extremely important, which is a lot of the reason why we now have all these uh, scopes, one to eight, one to six, uh, with red dot capabilities, so that if the guys go internal, they can use red dot on one power, and if they go external, they can get a little bit more zoom and taking targets at a little bit further ranges. However, I, as, as that has been happening, and that is extremely popular, and mm -hmm it kind of also morphed into off angle red dots hanging off the side of the gun because what guys started realizing was I'm just going to leave my, my um, scope on a power and I'm going to use an off angle red dot for low light, no light. I'm going to stop this dialing back and forth because very rarely were guys dialing to like 3.5 to four power. It was pretty much all or nothing. And if you're going to do that, then it really does help to run an off angle red dot for this setup. You're running a red dot for any, Thing that you believe is going to be up close and personal. You're running magnified for anything that you believe is going to be at distance. And this is nice and clean. So I can still see over the optic. I can shoot passively with this. And I still have this ability where it's not hanging off the left and it's not hanging off the right to be able to take targets at further ranges. I believe it's going to start turning into, as we have recce courses, I believe we're going to start running red dot recce courses. And the reason being is, is because with this uh, uh, magnifier uh, that EOTech has done to be able to jump that that footprint, it allows us to either be magnified on five or smack it out of the way and my red dot's still on and I'm still going to be taking targets up close and personal. The passive side of the house I think is a big deal and like I said for, for that kind of one gun setup to where I've got a active laser, I can run passive if I need to and I can run magnified is I think a, a big game changer uh, along with the fact that now we've got more magnification that we're squeezing out of what is pretty much the same footprint of what I've been using for three buys for many years. So something to th think about and take a look at when it when you're trying to balance out um, quote unquote fighting. Now Unity Tactical will be the first to tell you that if you get, drop prone with this mount and, and you want to shoot all day with it uh, in a prone position, you're not really going to like it. But where it really starts to shine with the higher mount is anytime you're in an improvised shooting position, anytime you're wearing full kit, anytime you're in a vertical plane and shouldering it with body armor on and helmets and everything, you will just be able to find the dot a lot faster. So it is something to consider that's out on the market. This uh, next mount that I'm gonna show you, it's uh, very specific. It's not gonna be for everybody. I look at it as complete fighting mount, uh, especially when we're talking about anything that's gonna be close proximity, anything that's gonna be um, uh, at night as well. So daytime, nighttime, obviously nighttime's obviously our worst case scenario. So before I show it to you, it reminds me a lot of Tropic Thunder. Dustin Hoffman, look retarded, act retarded, not retarded. Forrest Gump, slow, yes, retarded, maybe. Charmed to pants off Nixon during a ping pong championship. Man was a goddamn war hero. Well, the guys over at GBRS went full retard. And what you're seeing is one mount that is at a 2.91 height with the laser slave to it, meaning this is all one solid mount right here. Now, no ability to run any type of weird backup irons with this. Uh, there is no magnification that's going to be sitting up that they sell separately. This is just a dedicated fighting mount. Now, let's talk about a couple things. Back in the day, and I'm guilty of it too, I got photos of it, you know, it's like B-grade porn still out there. <clears throat> the laser, I used to have the laser sitting here, 
And the reason why is I could get to the controls real easy and it shifted all the weight back. And especially when you start putting cans on and you start running uh, 14 five inch barrels, they start getting real heavy up front. Um, so the drawback to that particular setup was when your hand is now here working a pressure pad, you could, if if you didn't run things in a, in a in the correct manner, you could get some splash with your IR flood off your hand, and and you need that. So then, guys started moving buttons down on the side, and it kind of took care of it, but it didn't really get rid of it. Um, it was still an issue, and you still had to be cognizant of it. With these guns getting smaller, and with the PCCs that are out on the market, the APC 9K and the Rattlers and whatnot, a lot of times you don't have a lot of rail space on those K model guns. And what happens is you put a laser there. And then immediately you've got like no room for pressure pads or anything. So to be able to run a mount like this for me, um, if I could have a mount like this and run it on my APC uh, 9, I would. And the reason is, one, it brings the laser back to me. Two, it just puts the pressure pad out front and it keeps everything as clean as possible. So weight distribution is towards the, the center line of the gun, which I really appreciate, with the ability to still use a functional laser and not have anything get in the way because of the way my hand position is here. The other thing is, on some of the lasers, like you saw with my mall, it's not like I can't take them all, roll it over just a little bit and fire that off. Even though I go to my left shoulder, I can still make it work. And then sometimes what you can do is buy the unity tactical buttons and add another button just solely for that purpose in case you have to do or perform a shoulder switch. However, to be able to do that from right shoulder coming out to go left shoulder, switching it, it keeps it really clean. And you can see that from hand position, to hand position, it keeps falling right on top of where my laser is. So primarily, I have the benefit on this to run passive, I can run active, I can run a shorter rail if I need to, I can keep everything as clean as possible. So I do get a lot of benefits. Now, one of the other things that we start to see in the arena of higher mounts, and this is gonna start from about the 193 and go vertical from there, is as soon as the shooter goes from one side of the gun to the other side of the gun and cheeks it, a lot of times they don't cheek it properly. And with these higher mounts, the ability to roll this over just a little bit and immediately be on it and track it does aid us. It's not just subject to this mount. The other mounts will do it as well. Like I said, anything 193 and above. But I do, I do think one of the cool things about the industry is when we start to look at specialty items like this, this isn't going to be a mount that's going to be on all your guns, but it's going to be on that gun. That gun, like if it gets really bad, you're, this is the gun, right? Type of thing. I really can appreciate uh, within the industry, guys always like striving for that next thing. Uh, it gives us as, as end users, a lot of different benefits to the way we like to set things up. I mean, it really is like Burger King. You can choose it and get it your way. So again, just some different options of mounts that are out on the market that you may be aware of and some of which you may not be aware of, but I hope this video helps you out.